There we go. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to the launch of the AFRI, which is the Ultron Fintech Household Financial Resilience Index, the AFRI. Um, my name is Danny Cohen, and I'm going to be moderating this morning. Um, welcome to those of you who are joining us who either were with us for the launch of the AFSCI on Tuesday or for the first launch of the AFRI um, in August. Um, the, the AFRI, as some of you will know, is the purpose of it is to assess the state of micro lending in South Africa from the perspective of borrowers to repay their loans. Um, and today, we have Johan Galatli, who's the MD of Altron Fintech, who's going to be our first speaker. And after that, we're going to hand over to Rolof Boerta, Dr. Rolof Boerta, who's the independent economist and advisor to the Optimum Group. And Rolof is the person who actually prepared the index, and he's going to take us through the Q2 2021 findings. Just briefly, some housekeeping. Um, Sandra will put um, her and my contact details in the chat group our email address. If any of you would like to arrange for interviews after the presentation, please let us know. We'll also be sending out a copy of the press release and we'll also pop a copy of it into the chat group. Um, we're going to keep this very informal after Johan and Dr. Boerta have made their presentations. We'll open it up to questions from the floor and um, we are also recording the presentation. So any of you who'd like a copy of the recording, um, it will be uploaded to the AFRI site on the Ultron Fintech site, and that will be included in the press release after the, um, after the presentation. So that's enough from me. I'd like to hand over to Johan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. And good morning to, to all the representatives from the media. Um, today is the launch of our, our, our second quarter AFRI in, index. Uh, the star of the show really is, is Dr. Rudolf Witter. Uh, we partnered with, with a doctor to um, to do analysis for us and research on on um, on the resilience of, of people that make use of short term credit in the country to repay that short term credit. Um, so so far, this journey has been marvelous for us, um, and the partnership is, re is really working well for us. Um, as part of um, Altron's um, strategic intent, uh, which is financial inclusion, we as um, Altron feel that we we have to measure. And if we don't measure, we can't make a difference. So, so this index is one of our, our, our small steps to start measuring um, what, what performance the, the informal um, sector is, is having on, on the country's economy. Um, and, and this index really works hand in glove with um, the AFSCI, um, the AFSCI that measures the impact of economic growth of the short-term credit market segment on the economy of South Africa. And, um, and the AFRI really measures the resilience of our people, the ones they've made, made use of short-term credit to repay that credit. Um, so the results thus far is very encouraging for us. Um, and we will we keep on measuring um, this, this informal sector. Hopefully um, these indexes will, will assist them, um, uh, policymakers and regulators um, to make, um, make subtle changes to, to this market segment and to fuel the growth um, in this market sector. Because we're of the opinion that the multiplying effect of fueling, fueling growth in this market sector is, um, is enormous. And, um, and we're really, really looking forward to this, um, this index and the research that we're doing with Dr. Olof Boerta paid dividends um, for, uh, not only for us, but for the country. So uh, thank you for attending this morning um, and looking forward to your questions at the end of the session. And um, Dr. Olof Boerta. Thank you, Johan. Um, right, I trust uh, everybody can hear me. I'm going to uh, hit share screen. And full mode. Uh, yes, uh, it's been a, a d disgusting November. I think most of us are very glad that the November has passed. We saw a dramatic decline in new COVID infections just for uh, this new variant to hit us. Uh, we saw resource stocks plummet as a result of the slowdown in China. 
but um, companies like ShopRite are doing incredibly well and the JSE as uh, I cannot uh, resist the temptation of uh, informing the media this morning that I did predict that in the beginning of the year that the JSE would hit 70,000 before the end of the year. Uh, I don't always get it right, but when I do, I tell people. But it has been a month of paradoxes. Uh, and one can also see that in the Altron Fintech um, Household Resilience Index, um, especially with regard to some of our indicators. And there are very few indices of this nature that uh, can boast 20 different indicators uh, weighted according to the, um, the, the, the demand side model of Altron Fintech's business and the microfinance business. And, and maybe just at the outset for any newcomers to um, these briefings is that one must distinguish obviously between your unregulated um, uh, microfinance sector and your regulated microfinance sector. There is a world difference between the two. Um, our plea has been for a while, uh, myself as an individual researcher and obviously you want from uh, somebody's perspective, um, is for government to to lend a, a sympathetic ear to uh, this industry because financial inclusion uh, has been proven in all the high income countries to be one of the prerequisites for sustained economic growth and uh, obviously ultimately also less income inequality. And in South Africa, we, we are still faced with a situation that you have to be fairly well to do to be able to access any form of credit uh, outside of your immediate um, friends and family that have businesses that may give you some credit. So uh, if one looks at the <clears throat> first one, by the way, at, at least we've been spared for the time being any uh, harsh lockdown regulations. And for those of you, another paradox has been just as the tourists started arriving again, uh, we've got the travel bans in place. But fortunately, in South Africa, domestic tourism is probably in excess of 90, 90%, close to 95% of the business. So this is not the end of the world. There will be plenty more variances as far, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, th this thing is not going to go, go away. We just we must just learn to live with it. And the, the initial evidence is that this latest variant is, is Mickey Mouse compared to uh, what we've had in the past. So let's uh, open play that is in fact the case. But at least those uh, um, people at the Command Council haven't uh, hit us with new lockdown regulations. I've been told, a friend of mine told me that uh, some of those people are so narrow-minded when they look through a keyhole, they use both eyes. Just on a lighter note. But on a more serious note, the uh, Elder Authentic uh, Household Resilience Index, which as Johan says, measures essentially um, the ability of households to incur debt and also to service their debt. And what frustrates Johan and myself and many other people in this, uh, you know, that are broadly uh, involved with the sector is that sometimes you have a report in the media which says that, oh, the default ratios have increased. You know, people are not paying their debts. But uh, it, it lacks objectivity from time to time because if, if those default rate ratios in the next month improve, then you don't hear a word. Uh, it's as if uh, the bad news, uh, you know, uh, is pushed to the forefront. And what we wanted to do here is a balanced perspective. The worst case, worst case scenario, if you don't have a balance, you fall over. Uh, but in our case, as Johan has indicated, one needs information, you need intelligence, you need to, to understand exactly what's happening in the sector. And that's why we went to, to extreme lengths to try to include everything we could into this index. But the bulk of the indicators are concerned with income, in whatever current or potential future form. So if the value of your, for instance, investment in a unit trust or whatever in a, a private and a listed company is increasing, um, if, if, that, if that value increases, you have a good chance of a higher dividend. Uh, we've seen, seen that now recently also with, with Afrimat. Um, it's a listed company in the construction sector, which by the way is not dead and buried. It's alive and kicking. Um, and, and they have got uh, phenomenal uh, results. So th that's, that's the, uh, the bulk of our indicators are concerned with income. But, uh, and I must introduce this caveat, it is essentially concerned with the relatively short term. So if you, uh, if you stop, if you surrender a, a policy, you've got a lot of money coming in now. Maybe if you've you know, been paying this for, for quite a number of years, 
So for the time being, your financial resilience has improved quite substantially. But uh, it's never a good idea, uh, actually, or hardly ever a good idea, because it could impact negatively on, on the longer term. So we are concerned with the, the current situation relatively short term. And as far as that's concerned, you can clearly see from the slide, I'm assuming everybody did see the slides, and I'll just be talking uh, briefly to, to some of them. And that full recovery is, is quite evident. This is a four quarter average. Um, I, I'm assuming most of you will realize that in South Africa, we have this uh, very predictable seasonal um, occurrence for uh, many indicators. It starts with retail and it goes right into GDP where we peak in the fourth quarter for obvious reasons. Many people receive bonuses. Um, it's holiday time. Many people have saved so that they can afford a trip to Cape Town or to uh, whichever province they want to go to. Um, and uh, obviously car rentals and presents for the kids and the grandchildren. So December is a retail bumper month. And in fact, the fourth quarter is a bumper month for retail because it starts, of course, in November with a Black Friday, the last Friday of every month by decree in the United States because Thanksgiving is on the last Thursday of November. So Black Friday is always the Friday following Thanksgiving. Uh, and it is a big, has become an international phenomenon. It's followed by Cyber Monday. Uh, and, and as a result of that, that uh, in the past, we had this enormous spike in, in, um, in the fourth quarter in December. But now we have the first element of that spike already in November. And then in the first quarter of every year, following this bumper fourth quarter, we are, as we say in Afrikaans, platzak, we're broke. That's the, <laughs> that's the English. Uh, because we spent all our money and it also, you know, uh, January is not a very productive month because not all South Africans are back in the office on the 2nd of January, <laughs> as some of you may be fully aware of. Uh, and February is the shortest month of the year. So the first quarter is always lousy. And then we, we build our, our way up again, up to the fourth quarter peak, and then it starts all over again. COVID, of course, created havoc with us, but we're right back to our old pattern, by the way. So in order to eliminate this seasonal issue, we work on a four quarter average. And as you can see, this, is, uh, this was fairly predictable. The downturn was predictable. Um, and if I may, I just want to point out that if you go, if you look at between 2014 and more or less 2016, you'll see a much sharper uh, rise than uh, until 2015, 2016. And then it starts to flatten out a little bit. It does in improve. Then it flattens out considerably on the route to COVID. And this is what I call the hangover from the Zupta era, the state capture era, the uh, decay of um, municipal service delivery era, which uh, was caused by the unbelievably weak corporate governance uh, during the previous president's term of office. I don't think we need to labor that point. But we are paying the price for the incompetence, um, the bundling, the bankrupt state-owned enterprises that we've had, uh, and, and all as a result of that decade, that uh, what has been turned by members of, senior members of the ANC, the lost decade. I'm not going to mention any names, but I think you know who we're speaking about. And President Ramaphosa, our new president, won his ticket, won the ANC presidency, prior to the South Africa's presidency in December 2017 on an anti-corruption ticket. And more than 100 people have already been arrested as a result of those crimes of alle or alleged crimes. So we are making, I like to believe he's making progress, but we must be patient because you cannot, you, you cannot fix 10 years of pathetic governance and a lack of coherent economic policy where you have a Department of Mineral and Energy Resources that is in a constant war with the private sector, the people that are supposed to assist in the transition to, to cleaner energy, which, which is, a, this is a no brainer, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and there is still a bit of that baggage left behind. So uh, it, it's a bit of an uphill battle, but at least we are moving in the right direction. This is very encouraging that the index as a whole has recovered um, more or less fully. If we uh, look at the um, next slide, uh, labor remuneration uh, in the public sector, 
at Corson 2021 prices did take a, a little bit of a dip uh, in the second quarter. But I, what we need to look at here is that the level of remuneration in the public sector in South Africa is higher than for the private sector. And this is a point of huge concern because in the private sector, in virtually all cases, the income that you receive, whether you are the CEO or whether you are you know, somebody that cleans the premises afterwards, uh, depending on your skill levels, it doesn't matter, but the, the remuneration that you receive is directly tied to the value that you add. And that is tied to the turnover and the profit expenses and the profit of that company. Profit is not an ugly word. It is a magnificent word because behind profit lies jobs, the bulk of the jobs in this country. And that's where government gets its taxes from. And that is why I believe that there should only be one economic priority in this country, and that's job creation. And one way to do that would be to incentivize the further development of the regulated microfinance industry without a shadow of doubt. My colleague Keith Lockwood, I think, pointed that out um, quite clearly a couple of days ago. Um, but at least there is an upturn in the, the private sector remuneration levels. That's obviously uh, some of the jobs, many of the jobs are, um, are, are being created again. Uh, a lot of companies gave their staff, as we call it, haircuts. In other words, depending on uh, you know, your uh, skills level and your profile in the company, you took anything between a 10% uh, and maybe even a 80, 90% knock, but that was temporary. Uh, total employment um, recovered initially quite nicely. The trend was good after the predictable COVID-induced uh, decline. Uh, I must be quite honest, and I don't want to labor this point. I don't think this is the right forum for that. But it's strange to me that Stats is I can rebase our GDP, swell it by 11%. That was an exercise which I, I find no fault with because every country does that uh, every four to five to six years. Um, but in the process, they haven't, they've managed to find new sectors of economic activity that add value to the economy. But they don't seem to have gone to the trouble of finding out how many people are employed in those sectors because the job creation data has stayed exactly the same. Uh, unless I'm making a grave error. Uh, I really don't trust these, uh, some of these figures anymore, especially if you, um, there, are, 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 there are contradictions in terms with some of the other macroeconomic indicators. But in any event, uh, let's not go into too much detail. The fact is that we need to create jobs in South Africa, uh, post haste Household debt, as a debt costs as a percentage of household income. This is a very encouraging trend. This has been in structural decline. Uh, it took a hit because of uh, COVID, obviously, and then it started declining again. I just want to point out to those that are statistically inclined, in our index, in the Eltron Fintech uh, uh, Household Resilience Index, this indicator features obviously quite strongly, but we use the reciprocal because the index needs to point out if the index moves up, it means that there is an, an improvement in the house of financial resilience of households. So what we do here is we calculate the reciprocal. So if uh, the reciprocal of this one obviously is, is, is upwards, uh, and that would have boosted um, the, the index, uh, especially in the last four quarters. Uh, unit trust assets at constant 2020 prices all of our indicators are expressed in real terms. They have been adjusted for the consumer price index. Um, and uh, th this is uh, very good news for people with unit trusts, of course. Um, th there used to be a cynical saying, how do you make a small fortune on the stock exchange? And the answer is you start with a big one. Now that of course is not necessarily true. It depends when you buy and when you sell. Uh, and in this case, of course, what this means uh, is that when people receive their unit trust statements, and that improves beyond a certain point, you can sell some of these units, uh, and you can build a Zoom room, as we call it, because a lot of us are Zooming, but our uh, houses, our home offices, as they become, are not always uh, conducive to a nice, peaceful Zoom session, because they are you know, people in the background sometimes, children, um, uh, spouses, um, dogs, cats, chickens, uh, in my case, grandchildren. 
So uh, you can also see the uh, increase in uh, construction activity for alterations and additions to homes is a clear indication that people are looking at their houses, uh, not only you know, from the perspective of, uh, as it used to be in the old days, of arriving after work uh, and having a cup of tea um, or whatever other beverage is your fancy, but also looking at this of, of a place where you are going to, you know, much of the time uh, be earning your living from. So this is also good news. Um, Long-term insurance claims paid and policy surrenders. Uh, this, this one has been expressed at, at current prices because I wanted to indicate the size of this. This is enormous. We are talking about um, surrenders uh, in 2020 um, of more than a quarter of a trillion rand. This is a hell of a lot of money, and you can clearly see that trend. Uh, this is, for the longer term perspective, not good news, but of course it has allowed uh, many households to be able to continue, um, you know, with, with the household consumption expenditure the way, the way they used to. Uh, maybe even buy a new car uh, or a new second-hand car, whatever the case may be. And hopefully they will start uh, saving again as, as quickly as possible. Uh, credit in payments by banks. That uh, was fairly stable until about 2018, towards uh, the beginning of 2019. Uh, then it flattened again, and then predictably during COVID, this increased. Very welcome development is that in the latest quarter, there has been a decline in this one. So that's good news. Um, obviously, uh, this indicator in our, in the Altron FinTech Index, we also use the reciprocal for this indicator. Ratio of household debt to disposable income, predictably that spiked in the second quarter last year. Uh, it came down quite dramatically. There was still a bit of a, a hangover and now it's also moving in the right direction. Once again, another a little bit, bit of good news, which is all, always welcome. And then total private sector credit extension. This is a, a, a point of concern because um, the Reserve Bank has now started lowering, uh, increasing interest rates again at a time when there is still not any sign of excess demand in this economy. Uh, if you have a decline, declining trend for such a long period of time in your private sector credit extension, then as a monetary policy authority, you should be lowering interest rates. You should be making it more attractive for people to actually go out there, borrow a little bit of money, you know, build a Zoom room, uh, uh, buy a new uh, uh, generator <laughs> for load shedding, uh, unpredictable load shedding, perhaps buy a welder for the little business that you're running, whatever the case may be. This is how you generate growth and employment creation in the economy. And the Reserve Bank is, is not part of this equation. They are obsessed with inflation, wherever it comes from. Uh, and, and that is a bit of a pity, quite frankly. Very good news. The disposable income of households, we also work on a four-quarter average for Obvious reasons, reasons I referred to earlier. Many people in South Africa have a huge fill up in their disposal income in the fourth quarter of every year. And to eliminate that seasonal impact, we work on a fourth quarter average. And this is a really very good news. We are not where we should be, but we are moving in that direction. Uh, then uh, just uh, something which has not been included in the media statement, but uh, you're welcome to request um, these slides from me as well, uh, via Danny and, and Sandra. I believe you do have the contact details. But it's encouraging to see uh, that the value of buildings completed by the, uh, in the metros and larger municipalities is showing a very uh, clear upward trend. And the ratio of alterations and additions, the value of alterations and additions to buildings to the total value of buildings completed, that has increased from 2020 to 2021, from uh, just over 20% to almost a quarter. Uh, a very clear indication that people are not only hanging on to their properties uh, to some extent, but they are improving their uh, properties, probably with a view to um, uh, being more virtually uh, employed in future uh, with virtual uh, tasks. Uh, bearing in mind that these uh, slides are one-dimensional, 
they, uh, I try to be objective, as you've probably noticed, uh, but they do remind me of the definition of a statistician, who is a person that will tell you if your feet are in the oven and your head is in the freezer, on average, you are quite comfortable, uh, which is certainly not the case, and I wouldn't try that. Um, this is unadulted good news. And once again, it demonstrates a bit of a paradox between some of the uh, stats, essays, data, and, and indicators, like, for instance, the FSBR PMI, which is conducted amongst, um, a I like to believe, a representative sample of manufacturers in South Africa on a monthly basis. And it's based on quantitative evidence, not on how do you feel today? <laughs> you know, those type of surveys. Uh, how do you feel today? Well, you know, if your team lost uh, over the weekend, uh, you're not feeling good. If you're a Sevens fan and you're a South African, you're feeling very, very good because of these, these fantastic blitz box of ours. Um, so this one is based on orders. This is based on employment. These, the, this uh, PMI is based on quantifiable evidence. And as you can see uh, on the slide, we took one hell of a knock in COVID, as happened in every single country in the world that is worth measuring. Uh, that would exclude Venezuela and Zimbabwe, uh, by the way, uh, North Korea and Cuba probably as well, uh, who have not yet uh, understood the benefits of free enterprise democracy. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, back to <laughs> back to economics. Uh, so what I want you to notice from this slide is that prior to COVID, we were already in trouble in, with regard to manufacturing, the manufacturing sector. It, the 50 borderline here is the difference between above 50 is expansion, below 50 is contraction. But look what happened after COVID. After COVID, we have, except for what happened in July, um, and we're all painfully aware of that. We've been above that 50 line all the time, and, we, and this index actually reached an all-time record high. Um, during, during COVID, and it bounced back very fast from the unrest in July, and it's a clear indication that the retail sector in South Africa has probably fully recovered, because virtually all of those shops that were, that, that were damaged are up and running again. And most of the people that used to work there are working there again. In addition to that, there has been an increase in the employment of security personnel. And there has been an increase in economic activity related to improving the security of the surroundings, which, by the way, is good for the economy. It's, it's once again, it's a bit of a, a bit of an irony that sometimes you have to, uh, <laughs> sometimes a bit of destruction is good for, for what, what will happen hopefully afterwards. In any event, this is really good news. It also tells us that the South African manufacturing sector has been able to fairly comfortably live with the odd load city. Um, I know it's irritating and during the tenure of the uh, Zupta appointees. Um, in any event, over, over to uh, some more good news. And this is splendid news, but it's related to my um, belief that the upward phase of the commodity super cycle is still in progress. There have only been four commodity super cycles in the last 130 years. Now, the commodity super cycle is, is a difficult animal to analyze because there are different commodities and not all of them move in tandem. So right now, the um, gold price is down, the iron ore price is, is down, platinum uh, is not looking bad, uh, coal is, is not looking bad, oil is not looking bad. Uh, so within the broader commodity cycle, you have some of the sectors, uh, the, the commodity sectors that, that work against each other. But remember that a super cycle has an upward phase and a downward phase, and neither is linear. So what will encourage people to, uh, what will encourage the resources sectors, you know, uh, if one can wrap it under that blanket, globally in the next, um, next decade or two, or perhaps even longer? The fact that in the next nine years, according to uh, authoritative research, 1.5 billion people, I'm going to repeat that slowly, 1,000, 
500 million people, more than the population of China, will enter what is called the middle class. The middle class is, is defined very broadly by World Data Lab as people that, depending on the country or the region where you are, uh, because purchasing power parity comes into the equation, people that can spend between $100 a day and $1,000 a day. Um, it, I know there's a huge difference. Fact is that if 1.5 billion people are going to spend between $100 and $1,000 a day in the next nine years, then my common sense tells me there will be a huge and increasing demand for virtually all commodities. Ultimately, hopefully, much lower demand for coal. Um, I think we all appreciate that. It's not going to happen overnight, but with a little bit of luck, ultimately, we will be able to save this planet. But that doesn't mean that there will not be a demand for steel, because these people will be buying cars, fridges, microwaves, houses. So uh, I'd like to believe that South Africa's commodity exports, which have been doing unbelievably well, and have given our government, uh, Mr. Kiesveter at National uh, at SARS, a uh, bonus of 120 billion rand, thanks to the mining company profits. I like to believe that despite some ups and downs, this should continue in the next couple of years. And that is one of the reasons why I'm bullish about next year's GDP growth. Rate. Virtually every economist that's worth his or her salt in South Africa knows that we will grow at 5% this year. It may be higher. I like to believe it may be 6%. But next year, there's no reason why we cannot carry this momentum forward. We will learn to live with COVID. The travel bans will be lifted within the next couple of weeks. I've got very little doubt about that. Tourism will recover. The left behind sectors are going to come to the party next year. They're going to be part of the equation. And I like to believe that we will grow next year also by between four and 5%. Thank you very much for your time. Over to Danny. Thank you, Johan. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute. I really appreciate that. I mean, Roloff, I really appreciate that. Um, I was wondering whether any of the journalists we've got on the call right now have got any questions. I've got a couple that have been sent through to me on WhatsApp. Um, if you have got any questions, please just put your take yourself off mute and you're welcome to ask your question to either Johan or Roloff. Okay, I don't see any coming through now. So I'm just going to ask, um, uh, both of you mentioned, you know, we, that we, it would be opportune to try and open up uh, the, the sector from a policy change perspective. Are there any specific policy or regulatory changes that you think should be implemented to try and um, extend credit to uh, uh, the lower end of the market in particular, obviously within um, a, a regulated environment, but are there any specific policy changes that could be introduced was, was the basis of the question that I've been sent. Johan, do you want, do you want to start? Do I start? Okay. Um, Thank you. So I'm, 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 I'm casting my mind back to a report that probably was, um, I was initiated by um, a research institute to attempt to, to assess what the unregulated microfinance market sector size is in terms of um, credit extenders. And, um, and that estimated that the unregulated market is, is in the region of, of between 30 and 40,000 uh, service providers that extend credit into the market that are operating um, in, in our market that is not registered. So from a policy perspective, obviously, it would make sense to, to attempt to, to lure these people into the regulated space so that we can start measuring again the impact of this, um, this economy um, on the growth of, of our country. So, so for, for me, it, it, should be, it should be a policymakers look at how do we, how do we include um, these these financial service providers get them uh, registered at the NCR, and how do we make it uh, process 
cost friendly, um, not burdensome from reporting, um, and still be conducive for them to conduct their business. Um, because we would like to get the, the unscrupulous operators out of the market, um, but it's a it's it's a fool's thought to think that you would eradicate them all. Yeah. And so there will always be people that, that conduct their business in that matter, in that manner. So so for me, there, there should be definitely a, a revisit of of um, the whole, whole environment and and to look at it again and how do we how do we make it accessible for people to register and then to play a role in this market. One should not forget that um, these financial service providers make use of their hard and savings to enter this business. Um, they can't go, can't go knock on the door of a bank and borrow money money to start up this business. This is a this is real entrepreneurs that are entering into, into this market segment. So so from that perspective, I would really like to, to see some some work in that regard. Okay, thanks. Um, Rolf, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yes. Uh, I mean, you want has an intimate knowledge of, of, of the industry itself. But my um, something which I'd like to wager is that uh, government could perhaps through uh, national treasury's involvement. Uh, I, I wouldn't want the reserve bank to be involved here. <laughs> they, uh, they, they tend to be um, not in touch with reality uh, in South Africa, but perhaps just to look at what policies have been followed in other emerging markets. And I think India would be a good starting point. Um, to, to 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 try to to get some uh, some hints of uh, what have governments done there policy wise regulatory wise to make sure that financial inclusion is 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 not necessarily achieved but that you work towards greater financial inclusion the point is is that there is a direct positive correlation between credit and economic output and between economic output and tax revenues. So even if government would, through some novel, it does, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but it, it could have been done in another uh, country where there's some form of subsidization or even maybe a screening process which assists the plight of regulated micro lenders because they, as you said, take huge risks. Uh, most of the operators, most of the businesses in this sphere have risked their life savings to, to be able to run a business. And, and obviously it's in nobody's interest if, if uh, the, the defaults are high. But uh, with, a, with a subsidized interest rate, somehow, somewhere, um, you can obviously also uh, reduce some of that risk. So in reducing the risk, looking at ways and means to reduce the risk is something which I think the industry could benefit from and the country can benefit from. And I think that's very important also for people in the media to, to always distinguish between the regulated micro lenders who are, who are wonderful people. I mean, what they, without them, this economy <laughs> would be a lot smaller, quite frankly. Mm. And, and, and the, what is called the loan sharks, etc. I mean, obviously, uh, it, sometimes they, they are uh, they are seen to be part and parcel of, of the same group. And that is absolutely not the case. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. I think it's really important. Um, I've got another question here. Um, what impact do you expect? What impact do you expect the Omicron variant to have on the index? The tourism and hospitality sector has lost over a billion rand since bans of travel have been enforced over the last few days. For you, Roloff, maybe? Yes, uh, as, as an eternal optimist, I, I must tell you that this caught me unaware. I mean, to go from virtually zero new, new infections to 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 8,000, you know, in the space of a couple of, I mean, this is my model. I, uh, this is really terrible. Uh, but um, from information I've received today from people that I know, uh, uh, and this is a medical professional, it's, it's, uh, and I'm not going to repeat his name, but he, he, he told his patient that uh, th this new variant is Mickey Mouse. This is like a very, very mild, this is like a mild cold. Uh, let's hope and pray that that's the case, um, because I think there's been a knee-jerk reaction to, towards this. The world will have to learn to live with COVID. The fact of the matter is that some emerging markets and developing economies will take 
forever to, to vaccinate, to reach uh, herd immunity, whilst uh, high income countries uh, who have reached vaccination rates of between 70 and 80 percent have new uh, infections <laughs> of between 50 and 100,000 per day, per day. Uh, but uh, if they are, if this is, if, if they are milder, if the fatality rate continues declining, then certainly we can we can start thinking of, of opening up again. And yes, our sympathy lies with the tourism industry, but as I indicated at the outset of my presentation, domestic tourism is is ninety percent plus of the South African tourism sector. So as long as as we are careful, stick to the protocols, um, you know, let's go and and and, and enjoy our holidays, you know. Uh, I don't see. Uh, I don't think that we uh, we shouldn't do that. Ho hopefully, there will not be our lock lockdown restrictions, but we don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty around, and uncertainty is not good for the economies. That's all I can but, say. So, uh, so then, if I can contribute, yeah, I think we must we must commend the government for not um, for not having a knee jerk reaction about this um, this new wave. Um, I think they have um, they've got a great team. Well, the president's got a great team around him from scientists and economists that is advising him at this stage. And, um, and I think they've take, taken um, some, some sound advice from, from those people how to react to this new, this new, um, this new wave. So, so from our perspective, I, I would like to congratulate the government and commend the government that um, they've taken the measured approach um, and to rule off point. I mean, we have to have our, our businesses operating for this festive season, um, um, okay. because I mean, our tourism industry has taken, and hospitality industry for that matter, has taken a, a severe knock on it. And some of those, um, as operators or customers of ours, and um, and some of them will never open their businesses up again. And what we shouldn't lose sight of, each of these businesses employed like three or four or five people. Um, now, if you if you have a thousand of these, that's that's five thousand people that you employ, um, and and that's. That's the power of the multiplying effect of, of this um, the sector and what the sector is fueling in the growth of our economy. Mm. Thank you, Danny. Okay. Thank you, Johan. Um, mm. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, I think I'm going to ask um, Rolof, if you wouldn't mind, just to share with him, us a few closing remarks and then Johan to do the same, and then I'll close off the engagement. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> yes, um, as I said at the outset, uh, uh, the, the uncertainty surrounding this, this new variant, <clears throat> the uncertainty <clears throat> surrounding the uh, imminent recovery of the tourism industry uh, is really uh, bad news for the economy as a whole. But if one looks at some of the indicators that I've shown, the Purchasing Managers Index, the uh, Composite Business Cycle Indicator of South Africa, which reached a new all-time record high. The Joburg Stock Exchange, which has reached a new all-time record high, and that with uh, major blue-chip companies paying dividends of, of between 10 and 20%. That's the dividend yield uh, of some of these companies. Price earnings ratios of blue-chip companies in single-digit territory. Uh, we've got the, one of the strongest balance of payments in the world, uh, a, a, a quarterly trade surplus approaching 100 billion rand. Now, if you told an economist two years ago that we would have a, a quarterly trade surplus of 100 billion rand, bearing in mind that for the previous 30 years, we never had a trade surplus, <laughs> not on average, uh, they would have told you to go for observation, to best copies, if you're in Gauteng or Falkenberg, if you're in Cape Town, it's a place for the very, very, very nervous. Um, and, and uh, it has happened. So the, there are a lot of fundamentals that tell me that next year we can build on the 5% growth momentum. And with a bit of luck, if we can learn to live with uh, the, 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 the virus, if we can raise our vaccination rate, I'm convinced that 2022 will be better than 2021. I hope I'm correct. Thanks. Thank you, Rola. Johan, I'd like to you to offer the last remarks for the day. Thank you, Danny. Thank you for the media that attended this morning. I know that uh, it's, you're a very, you've got very, very busy schedules and especially this feverish season that we're going into. And Danny and Sandra, thank you for hosting and moderating and, and arranging this, uh, this session. And then Rulof, thank you for your hard work and effort um, to put the index together. 
And, uh, and for us, it's really encouraging. Um, we're, we're seeing really good signs uh, from measuring um, the inputs into this index. And, um, and, and there's lots of people that are saying that uh, South Africans are unresponsible um, lenders or mm. borrowers of credit. Um, and this is clearly contrary to that. So, so we've got resilient and responsible people that pay back their credit. So, um, yeah. so that's a message that we would like to to uh, to take into the market, and um, because that's what the research and the, the measurement indicates to us. So, thank you once again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. That's a great message to end with. Just to reiterate to everybody, um, we will be emailing you all a copy of the press release, and we'll get a copy of your uh, roll off slides as well, and share those with you. And as soon as we've got a recording from this webinar, we'll add that to the link as well. It'll all be available on the Ultron FinTech AFRI section of their website. Um, and if you've got any questions for us or you've got any interviews you'd like to set up with either Johan or Roloff, please let Sandra and I know. And thank you once again. We look forward to reporting back to you in another three months' time. Goodbye. Goodbye.